Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord together. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Is that your prayer this week? God was on the throne last week. God's on the throne right now. God's going to be on the throne. No matter who we put in a little chair. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, we can't thank you enough that you are the ruler of everything. All the way down to my heart. And so, Lord, I, I turn everything over to you. I give it all to you. I celebrate in you. I cry to you for my need. I come to you in thanksgiving. Everything. All through you, God. Lord, in this moment, we choose right now, we're going to lift our hands and our voices and our attention directly to you. For these few minutes, we're going to offer up this time of singing and worship and surrender. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
It's okay to have a little fun in church.
as I enter rest. I depend on you. I depend.
turning our eyes to Jesus. What a beautiful view to see the lover of our souls, right? Now everything else becomes, no, it's, the perspective changes, right? We're going to celebrate what he has paid at this point. And so with the communion service, we don't wait to give him praise till we see something move. We praise him because he deserves to be praised because we know that one day we will be reunited with our Father in heaven. We will meet Jesus, the one who died in our place, and you're in my place. You know, the celebration that the, of Passover that the Jewish nation celebrated as they were uh, brought out of Egypt into their promised land. That is fundamental and core to who that people are, the Jewish people, the land of Israel. And Jesus, being a Jew, celebrated that Passover meal with his disciples right at the very end of his ministry on earth, right as he was about ready to be the sacrificial lamb and pay the ultimate price for our eternal life. And the words that he said, if you could pull up that are certainly need to be understood in the context of what the Passover meal meant to the Jewish nation. They understood that they, it was a, a remembrance of what had happened. And in order to have it be very tangible, they took the elements of bread, the unleavened bread, a hasty Retreat, as and not retreat, escape into their promised land as they left Egypt. They took that bread and they ate it. They had it become part of them. It was their food for the journey. And they took the cup of wine, which signified the blood of an innocent lamb that was killed and its blood sprinkled on the lentils and doorposts of their homes. Though blood was not to be ingested, they understood that in this context of remembrance, that blood that was poured out became their life-giving blood. So they took it into themselves and drank it symbolically and Jesus explaining to his disciples before he was going to pour his own life blood out and have his body broken and pierced for our sin and our spiritual nourishment said these words in John 6 47 through 51 truly truly you who believe, he who has believed has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, yet they died. This is the bread that came down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. And I'm sure he went, this is the bread. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And this bread which I give for the life of the world, you too, is my flesh. At this, the Jews began to argue amongst themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I tell you, Unless you eat of the flesh and drink of the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day, for my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your fathers who ate the manna and died, the one who eats this bread will live forever. And we who understand that we need to ingest Christ and symbolically, if you would take the elements of, of this communion meal now, and we give thanks for this, O oh Lord, what you have done. And we take the bread, as it were, symbolically, Jesus' body, broken, and have that food, who he is, be part of us. For the nourishment of your soul. And also, the cup, which represents the blood of Jesus that was poured out for you, the life of Christ that you might have the life of Christ within you. We thank you for what you've done, Jesus. And we receive this as nourishment and for our souls. Thank you, God. You are good. You are holy. And thank you, you have made us holy by the washing of your word and by the blood which you shed, which is able to alone cleanse us from sin. And all God's people said, Amen. This morning, I get to present the second part in the series on truth. And this one is called Feed on the Truth. The last time I spoke, I asked the question, what is truth? And we saw that the word of God tells us that truth is, first of all, God's objective judgment of reality. What God sees is the unbiased truth. God's evaluation of truth, he defines truth. And we also were comforted by the fact that truth not only exists, but it's also knowable. And truth has a name. His name is? I want you to say it with some gusto a few times. So I want to get your pipes already warmed up. So if I end up going like, who is it? Or Jesus. Jesus. All right, so one, two, three. Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the truth, the life, and the way. It says in John 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, with a capital S, Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We understand that because God, the creator of all things visible and invisible, who himself is the very definition of truth, revealed this to us in his word. His word is in print and on our tongue, a representation of who Jesus is. He has identified himself so much with what he has stated in his written word that he says, I will back up my word, which I give you. God, Jesus has given us the right to be able to speak his words with the authority that he spoke them. If we are led by his spirit, when he says, 
Speak my word. My word will not return to me void, but it will accomplish the very things that I intended it to do. Because, because of this, our focus needs to be fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the truth and the source of our life. And uh, in 1 John 5, verse 20, it says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. It's a safe place to be in Christ. In his Son, Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. Because of this, our spiritual life and our nourishment comes from being filled with Jesus, who, who is the one who the Father sent. And we, said, we read this already, but I want to read it again in John 6, 57 through 58. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Because Jesus is alive, if we feed on him, have him be part of us, welcome him into our hearts, we have life. Jesus said, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your fathers who ate the manna and died, the one who eats this bread, speaking of himself, will live forever. Hallelujah. Our spiritual life and nourishment is, comes as a result of filling ourselves with Christ. So we need to feed on the truth. Feed on him. I am the bread of life, he says. Now, this morning, when I woke up, I believed that the Holy Spirit prompted me to, to read a portion of Scripture to explain why I'm going to be in this wonderful message of encouragement. I will also be speaking of some of the fine print on the bottle, the warning labels, as it were, the things we need to be on guard for. Why would I have a downer in the middle of such a, a beautiful thing about speaking the truth? But, and, and, and I like to, be, to come and bring you words and just encourage you all the time. But last week, as Jesse brought a word of repentance that says, I'm sorry, my job as a pastor, and as he preached, preached the word last week, was not to stroke you and make you feel okay when you aren't okay. Amen. You are saved and redeemed, and you are all set for heaven. But you need to clothe yourself with righteousness, the righteousness that Jesus provides for you. And you need to walk in truth. And so sometimes when you come to church, we're going to comfort you. But sometimes we're going to make you uncomfortable, as it was last week. And there may be times in this message that you will feel uncomfortable. You might be, feel like, whoa, you're making me nervous to feed, to eat spiritual food. Because you say latent within some of the food that is being presented on the various platforms and by various people, there's an element of poison. I would love to just talk about all the good food as you feed, uh, feed your soul. But sadly to say in this last days, the enemy has joined the church. Amen. Not the church of Jesus Christ, but the church that has steeples on it, and even in this room. He comes in secretly, quietly. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid of obvious poisons and traps. What's most dangerous is the lead in the paint that your children nibble on as they look out the window at the cars going by eating the paint off the window. That has a longer term ramifications. It's a slow poison. And so I'm warning you today to listen clearly because I'm going to encourage, but I'm also going to warn. 
And so the Holy Spirit brought to mind Jude, the book of Jude. And I'm going to read Jude's. Was in the same situation where I want to bring encouragement. I want to say good things. But I have to warn you instead. Jude 1. There's only one chapter. 3 through 4. Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once and for all. For some people who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. Where have they come into? The church at least amongst the believers, have come in by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of God into sensuality, feelings. How do you feel? It's all subjective. And denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. So you're warned. I love the story of the woman at the well Let's listen in on the conversation, and especially as Jesus declares that he would give her a never-ending supply of water and eternal life. And it's found in at John 4, 15 through 24. The woman said to him, Sir, give me water so that I may not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. And he, Jesus, said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said it. You good observation. For all of those who think that marriage, if you just say you're married and go into her that you're married is enough, that is not true. Jesus said the man she was living with was not her husband. She was married, and so Jesus was re- recognizing that even secular marriage, the covenants that people make together to promise to live till death do us part, God holds them responsible for. Don't say, well, I wasn't a Christian, therefore it doesn't count. Well, you certainly were not geared up right for this thing, and <laughs> failure was in the seeds. But let's go on. He said, you have no husband, Jesus said to her. You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, been married five times, and the one you are now, now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. (laughs) Duh. And then she immediately Switches gears. I, enough about me and where, where I'm at, you know. Let's, let's talk about some theology. Let's, let's argue about something. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you people say that, that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you don't even know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. They at least had the Old Testament understanding correct, at least the words and the, the, the steps. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Hallelujah. And and the the revelation, the word appeared in flesh before her, and it was awesome. What did Jesus mean when he said those who worship him must worship him in spirit 
and in truth. Spirit speaks of the heart and attitude that we approach God with. It's a humble. It's, it's a, one of recognizing that um, he's God and you aren't. You're the created. He's the creator. And he is other than us. And your flesh is not okay to see God. Your spirit is where we start the connection with God. It's a spiritual connection before you ever will have a restored body in heaven someday. Because of the fallen nature of, of man, we, we have to wait a little bit before we can see him with our physical eyes. Truth. Truth describes the way we must approach him. And that is with reverence because he is holy. And he is to be feared who can not only destroy the body, but your soul, your spirit. Amen. Reverence. We should not be careless about coming into God's presence. He is holy. And the closer I come to seeing him who saved me and loved me, the more I, I'm, I'm drawn to him, but I, it's with fear and trembling, not because I'm afraid of him, but because he's so awesome and holy. Every one of us will fall face down before him someday and say, how dared I raise my, my fist against the Almighty on this earth? What do, what's I thinking? Like Job, I've spoken and I will not speak again. We approach God in truth because he is holy and with obedience. Don't think you can do your own thing. Oh, yeah, greasy grace. Oh, I know God doesn't like that, but you know what? I'm, I, 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 he loves me. He forgave my sins. He died on the cross. Died on the cross? He, you are a bought with a price. How dare you trample on the blood of, of Christ and squander his grace because you're just walking around, do whatever you want. That's the way we come when it comes to truth. Obey God. You say you love God? Obey him. Both spirit and truth are necessary and must be present in our worship for God to receive our praises. The, the consequences of ignoring either one will make our words and actions useless, a mockery. And it will turn our religious practices, no matter how pious, into an insult to God because of the hypocrisy of a life not matching what our words say. In the Old Testament, in Amos, the children of Israel were continually going astray. They were an example. We saw the, the, the action of following God, seeking God, and, and then blessing in the short time, and then the pleasures of life because it was easy. They no longer had to fight, and they, they went back into sin. It was terrible, and they, they, they slacked off and became sloppy agape, all right, and, 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 and disregarded God but they kept the religious practices up. They kept going and offering their sacrifices. So let's read what the prophet Amos said in Amos 5. Verses 3, 4, and 6 say over and over again, For thus saith God, seek me that you may live. God always starts with an invitation. He doesn't come down with a club, says, you bad people. He says, there's a way. Come to me, who are, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you peace. That's the way God's overture to us. It's his mercy that brings us to salvation and repentance. But his mercy will not continue if we stiff arm and reject his salvation. How can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And so we read in verses 10 and 11, 
They, the people of Israel hated the people who stood up and called for righteousness and repentance, saying, they hate him who reproves in the gates. In other words, if you're calling out sin, they will hate you. Get used to it, brothers and sisters. If you point out unrighteousness, they will dislike you. And they abhor the one who speaks with integrity. You speak the truth, it's not going to go well with you. You won't always be invited to the parties. The people had become hypocrites and hated those who spoke the truth. So what was God's response? So God said in verse 21, I hate and I reject your festivals. I do not delight in your solemn assemblies, your church services. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, you do all the stuff. I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. Is your praise acceptable to God? Are you living in the blessing and power of spirit and truth? Are you feeding on him or are you feeding your soul the nourishment, the empty calories of this world which will bring you to destruction? So what does God have to say we need to do to purify our worship and make it acceptable to him? In the same chapter, in verse 24, it tells us, hallelujah, but let justice roll down like water. Start doing what's right for God's sake. And righteousness, like an ever-flowing stream, let the righteousness of God, which he has given you, pour out of you, a nourishing stream. In other words, we need to begin to worship him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Who are we worshiping? Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Psalm 51 describes the correct spirit with which we must worship our God, saying, Psalm 51, 16 through 17, for you, speaking of God, will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it, and you will not be pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Do you acknowledge your brokenness at times. I do. All I'd have to do is look in a mirror. All I have to do is rehearse my day. And my spirit goes, God, how dare I talk? And he lifts my chin. He says, I love you. I've covered that. I died for you. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. I'm sorry, God. Oh, God, you will not despise. Hallelujah. That is the way that we are to come to him with a correct spirit. Worshiping God in truth describes the way we approach him. We must never come to God on our own terms. Well, this is the way I'm going to do it. We come on his terms. Religion is man's attempt to reach God. I've said this many times. But Jesus is God's way to reach man. It says in Acts 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven which has been given among men by which we may be saved. Although the scripture defines and determines how we must come, we need to take this seriously, spirit and in truth. God hasn't changed the way that he operates in the New Testament. The old, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, 
God has a prescribed way for us to come to him. From the story of Cain and Abel's sacrifice in Genesis 4, where God required Cain to sacrifice a lamb for, to, uh, uh, to bring that offering to God. Instead, Cain thought, man, well, what I've got to give is I'm a, I'm a farmer. I'm going to bring a grain offering. I'm going to offer what I produced, what I can do, not what you're saying I should do. I'm doing this on my way. That's, that was just the first of many times. The Bible is very clear. When we see the meticulous instructions of how Moses must build the tabernacle all the way down to every piece and, and, and how it is to be put together and, and how it is to be made. This meeting place between God and man, even the source of the fire that is used in the offerings and sacrifices. All of these are instances, every one of them point to Jesus who is the Lamb of God. His blood sprinkled on the mercy seat. The Lamb, none of the sacrifices, any of these practices that they, that they were to do meticulously was for them to understand God's way is the only way that you will have access to the Holy of Holies. Amen. And that was a shadow and a type before Jesus, the one we feed on, came and gave his blood and made a way for us to enter into the holy, holy of holies. The Lamb of God who gave himself a sacrifice for sin. And Jesus has always been the only way to the Father. John 14, 6 through 7 says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Hallelujah. Since Jesus stood before them and he proclaimed the word of God, those who saw and heard with their hearts saw and heard the father. The gospel that Jesus proclaims is totally inclusive. And it's totally exclusive. Whoever comes, who, those who are thirsty, come to me and drink, he says. But he says there's no way into the presence of God except through Jesus Christ. It's open to everyone. Jesus emphasized that by saying in John 10, verse 1, truly, truly, I love it when Jesus repeats himself, this is the truth. Let me say it again. This is the truth. I'm telling you, he who does not enter by the door, in other words, Jesus, who's the way, the truth, the door, the gate, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, that's the church, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. So he's alluding to that not everybody who is here among us or that you may hear claim to say, I'm of God, I'm of, I love Jesus, is of God. Truth is not negotiable. Either it is true or a lie. I'm going to say something here, and I want you to remember this. Just as light and darkness cannot occupy the same space. So, two belief systems that contradict each other cannot both be true. And the world is trying to say, there's many ways to the Father. In fact, they create their own ways. Well, my God would never do... Well, your God is not the God of the universe then. Because the God, my God says there, he is the only way. I've noticed that many accept God, but they seek to know him on their own terms. Christians are foolishly adding pagan and new age spiritual techniques to their worship 
trying to supplement their experience and their communion with the Almighty using unholy fire. Things that sound so innocent, if not even noble, contemplative prayer. Well, now I will tell you, I contemplate when I pray. But there is a huge amount that falls underneath that where you sit and you wait. And do you wait when you pray? A better, better shut up once in a while and let God speak to you in prayer. But you don't sit there trying to conjure up with your imagination who you want your who deity is, and then let your mind run free. Empty your, empty your brain. No, we don't empty our brain to hear God. We fill our brain with what he has said. Amen. All right? I'm, I'm, if this is stepping on anyone's toes, I challenge you. There is much I have seen in my almost 50 years of living for Jesus where people who started with this and all of a sudden God's telling him all kinds of stuff that do not line up with scripture and it's not true and it gives him a soft, a, a, a comfort, but it is not the truth. It's a comfort that is a, in a, a delusion and they feel okay and the enemy is just okay with you feeling okay as long as you're not okay. I don't know. Things that sound so innocent, even spiritual, like the law of attraction. Oh, God, help us. I, from, I, from pulpits in this community, I've heard people speak of messages or speakers coming into their churches speaking of that. Or some of you speaking on things which smack of the deception of the law of attraction. Creating vision boards that says, all right, this is what I see my future is to be. And I put it all up there, and I'm going to believe that that's what's going to happen. You need to follow God's spirit and let him be the one who have the plans. You can make plans. There's nothing wrong with having a little bit of vision. I know I'm going home today, and I'm going to love on my wife because tomorrow I celebrate 45 years of marriage. You know what? That's a plan. And uh, hopefully it comes true. <laughs> I hope to be around for a few more years in the blessed blessing of having living with that perfect woman, Barb. All right. Enough, enough of, 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 of this stuff. But the thing is, is if you are trying to end up visualizing what your future is and believing that if I just have my mind only keep those visions in my mind, you won't hear what God has to say. Your visions are, may run very contrary to God. Don't put a vision board up and end up, uh, uh, think that the law of attraction is going to have that or Enneagrams. Oh, now I want to find out who I am. I want to understand who I am. I'll use some uh, 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 foreign fire, some deceptions borrowed from secular and pagan things, charts, to end up taking that and use that to help me to understand myself. I need to have the Lord say, search me and know me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake because of what you say, not because you have some kind of enneagram that you are, are end up mapping your life. What's different than, that than a horoscope? Very few, but it's been creeping into the churches. I know churches that are actually having small groups looking at their enneagrams and trying to see, now I know how to relate to you. It's not okay. Inner healing. I want inner healing. But the, underneath that and the theophastic uh, ideology and methodology that has as if you're going to rewrite your history and go back and have a do-over. Just because it works and gives you a false peace or even helps you to deal with your anxiety or trauma does not mean it's right. Cocaine will make me feel happy and confident. 
Watch out. Watch if I was on cocaine, you'd really hear some bl blistering, uh, you know, bold stuff. But I tell you what, it wouldn't be true. I've never touched this stuff myself because I've never taken drugs because I like, I'm, I have an addictive personality and if they liked it, then I'd have to fight it. So don't touch things you shouldn't touch and then you won't have to fight it. Can I have an amen from anybody? <laughs> the Bible says, be not drunk with wine for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. I feed myself the word of God. Then because of that, I, I want to be sober-minded and vigilant because the enemy's walking around like a roaring lion. So this isn't about, oh, they didn't mention, the, uh, you know, edibles. I can have a little uh, edible there and, uh, you know, you know, well, you know, that makes me feel good. Well, my friends they got together, all doing it. You know, it's a, we talk about Jesus, for God's sake. When I led someone to the Lord a long time ago, he was smoking pot while he was doing it with his Bible open. Thank God he doesn't smoke pot anymore because finally he realized that he better have his life. That was before. <laughs> okay, done with that. I'm going to be sober-minded. I'm going to have the Holy Spirit speak, me, speak to me instead of any amount of illusions or delusions I might have. Yoga, Christian yoga. Just stretch, ladies. Walk. I have no problem with trying to get, but when you start doing positions that are declarations of a sign language to the unknown allegiance, and while all at the same time mantras are being quoted out there, don't expect that that's going to end up doing more, doing no damage to your spirit. You are inviting demonic principalities into your situation and the enemy comes in like, a, like an angel of light. And you might get a little flatter tummy, but you, it's rots in the nostrils of God. The church is taking in blatant practices from other religions, blatantly taking it in. If we add extra biblical practices to our exercise of worship in our attempt for spiritual development, it is a departure from God's truth. Adding to truth makes it a lie, though it might excite your body, your mind, and your soul. It will eventually, it will eventually point to self instead of God. Because it's your way or man's way. There's a word for this. Syncretism. That's the word. Let's say that together. Syncretism. All right? You don't want to do it when it comes to your faith. The definition of syncretism is the combining of different and often contradictory beliefs while blending practices of various schools of thought. Syncretism involves the merging and analogizing of several originally discrete traditions, especially in theology and mythology and religion, thus asserting an underlying unity and allowing for an inclusive approach to other faiths. I accept everyone. I try to get along with everyone in as much as lies within you, live at peace with all men. I do that. I don't expect the world to follow my religion, and, but the, my, my faith, religion, my, my following of Jesus. If they're not saved, I don't hold them to that standard, even though God will judge them for their unrighteousness if they reject Christ. But I cannot stand the symbol that is coexist. When they merge all these symbols for religion and um, aberrant behavior underneath one and says we should just make a blend, that is syncretism. And it's the mantra of this age, but we can never sacrifice truth on the altar of unity. Second Thessalonians. 2, 19 through 11. 
The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by works of Satan. And every kind of power, signs and false wonders, and with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing. Because they refused the love of the truth that would have saved them. Wow. And for this reason, God has sent them a powerful delusion. God said, you want to go that way? Go for it. I will not stand in your way. In fact, I will get out of the way if you choose, because you got a free will. You can choose. For this reason, God will send them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. If you wonder why the, those that are deceived seem so emphatic, and persuaded is because their hearts are against the truth. They do not want to submit to the Almighty and be saved. The book of Jude warns of this delusion. So we need to test everything against the word of God, the Bible. Be on guard and we need to feed on the word of God. We need to hold fast to the truth. As it says in 1 John 4 verse 1. Beloved. Uh, now we're back to loving words. You, who God loves, beloved, believe not every spirit. Even things that come from people that you really like at your favorite preacher. Andy Stanley's preaching some really bad stuff. Many of the big name people, the popular people that speak more eloquently than those off this pulpit who have been given a charge to guard over your souls that you like them better. They stroke your ear just better and they don't have, aren't linguistically challenged like me. But many of them are going the way of Jude and it is not okay. God has placed you here for your protection. Stay in the body. Stay ears receptive to the truth, even if it hurts and challenges the person you like so much on the internet or your tapes that you've been following. Because God has care so much. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. In Galatians 1, 6 through 9, it says, I'm amazed, the Apostle Paul speaking, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, one that has different criteria, which is really not, not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, even if the one who was so good at presenting the truth, the apostle Paul included himself there, even if we, or an angel from heaven, and most deception comes as an angel visitation, or special revelation, special knowledge, watch out for them, test it with the word, and then bounce it off a couple of brothers and sisters. Before you start sharing it, make sure, test it on people that you know. Come to me, I'd love to talk with you. I love to talk about Jesus. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, he is to be avoided. No, it says some, he is to be accursed? That's harsh. As we have said to you before, so I say it now again. Well, he's going to be softer next time. If any man preaches to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Oh, that wasn't a slip up of the tongue. By the Spirit of God, he says, there's a curse on anyone who's going to pervert the truth of the gospel. They're an enemy to your souls. A while back while I was talking with a brother about deception, the stuff that was creeping into the church and things that he'd been hearing, the Lord brought to me a very obscure phrase. Out of, out of nowhere, a word came by the Spirit into my mind. There's death in the pot. And, and I looked up in the scriptures where that was, because I do know the story. 
But it's more obscure, and I want you to listen because there's some truth in this that you, as a body of Christ, who go to GCF right now or whatever church you may be listening to online, there's a truth that needs to be understood in this story in 2 Kings 4, 38 through 41. And let's read what it says here. When Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land. As the sons of the prophet were sitting before him, he said to, he said, uh, to his servants, um, okay, I want you to catch something right away. This is Elisha talking to those who were in charge of, of communicating God's word. There was a famine in the land. They needed food. And and they were, they're sitting together. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And so he, he's going to give them some food and nourishment. So as the sons of the prophet were sitting before him, he said to his servants, put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. We're going to have a, a feast, a shared meal. Then one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered it into his lap, a lap full of wild gourds, and came up and sliced them into the pot of stew. For they did not know what they were. So they're getting stuff that looked good to eat, appetizing. Reminds me of the Garden of Eden. That, that looks good to eat. And they didn't know what it was or where it came from. And they cut it up and put it into the food that they were going to feed the prophets. And so they poured it out for the men to eat. And as they were eating out of the stew, they cried out and said, Oh, man of God, <laughs> there's death in the pot. Oh, my God, a bellyache. Oh, this is, this is killing us, man. There's, this, this is going to kill us. And they were unable to eat. Wow. This is what the Holy Spirit ended up communicating to me. Notice the next verse. What did Elisha tell them to do? The cure for the poison in the food that they were feeding on. So he said, now bring meal. And throw it into the pot and said, pour it out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. And the Holy Spirit, I believe, spoke very clearly to me. What is meal? It is processed, not, not the process that uh, you don't want all the chemicals added. But it was cultivated food, grain, that they knew where it came from and it was handled appropriately and uh, prepared as healthy food. Take that which has been healthily prepared that is good to eat, dare I say truth, and throw that into the pot. And having the truth of good prepared truth We'll offset all of the little bit of poisons that you may pick up in your digesting of food out there. God has placed you in this body, and God has given us as elders and other ministries within this body and pastors as well to oversee and charge and look for doc uh, oversee the moral and doctrinal purity of the church. We take this seriously. And because of that, because of words like this, you are able to discern the poison that is in the food supply that so many are ingesting. You can discern it. Hallelujah. And so with humility, don't go for your private interpretation. Amen. Find out why God put you here and listen to what God has, the word of God that's coming forth from here. Or don't come here. Because if you are not coming to be able to be teachable, then why are you here? If you are not in receive mode, why are you listening? If you know better than everybody, go start your own cult. 
Because if it's, you're knowing better than, than the simple word of God, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified and staying true to the word and pointing out where, naming names when names are necessary. If, if you aren't willing to do that, you're going to be a sucker for every wonderful, fanciful idea where God told me this, God told me that, and angelic visitations. He will fill your mind with all kinds of crazy things if you don't test every spirit to find out if it's of God, if not, and be willing to hear a tough answer that says, no, nah, I would rebuke that. Why? Because chapter and verse and because this, this, and this. All right? Can we say amen to that, brothers and sisters? So I'm going to end with one scripture here. 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 5. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their desires, what they want to hear, and their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth. That is tough. That is exclusive though totally inclusive for all those who would submit to it. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, and you will have to endure some hardship if you stand for the truth. Do the work of an evangelist. Go tell people about Jesus. It's good news, <laughs> and it, it, it is life to those who hear it. Fulfill your ministry. At this point, I would like us to stand up. I want you to bow your heads. Because I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God will pour out, as he promised, a spirit of revelation and discernment. Because we're coming into a time where the body of Christ will be divided and some will move away from the gospel and some will hold to it and be considered judgmental or too exclusive. And you're going to need to be strong because you're going to be coming against a current of unrighteousness and foolishness. But you need to respond with the truth in love. So, dear Father in heaven, as I stand here humbly, broken in spirit for the state of not only myself in my complacency so often, but also with my brothers and sisters who probably might feel the same way at times. As we stand here in your presence, we ask that you, with your spirit, would pour out a fresh revelation of who you are, who Jesus is. And we would run to you instead of all the other sources and false solutions. I pray, God, that you would give us an outpouring of your Holy Spirit that would give us discernment and joy. I pray, Lord, that you have, would pour out your spirit in a way that would give wisdom as we speak, that would silence those that would come against the truth because of the anointing of God's spirit of wisdom. I pray, Lord, that prophetic gifts would pour out and be released in Jesus' name, that we dare to proclaim who Jesus is and do it boldly. I pray in the name of Jesus that we would have courage to stand against the darkness and know what to do, when to do, and how to do. I pray, Lord, that you would bring revival to your church. And as the church becomes alive and rejoicing and looking at you, I pray, Lord, that we would be released as ambassadors of righteousness in this world that needs to see light, not hypocrisy. I pray, dear God, that this nation and the, this entire planet of people that you love 
would see and notice what the church of Jesus Christ is doing and that they would be drawn to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray this all in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, all right. Make sure that you go out and, and shine. Grab your Bible too. Spend a little time feeding on the word. If you would like prayer, you can come to the front here and someone will be here to pray for you. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages by Calvin Berksma, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Church. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server. And install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capability.